let's stay with issues of climate change, destructive weather patterns. The release this week of another climate change report is emphasizing just how critical it is that we actually slow down the rate at which temperatures are rising. The United Nations Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change report says as a planet we are unlikely now to keep our temperature rise at or under 1.5 degrees Celsius higher than pre-industrial levels. Now, missing that target will make it very hard to avoid disastrous climate consequences. Well, what does this report mean for our region, already beset with severe weather? We heard about uh, the floods in April last year, and of course, more recently, Cyclone Freddy, devastating parts of Mozambique and Malawi, leaving over 500 people dead and thousands more replaced. I'm joined now by Dr. Christopher Trisos, Director of the Climate Risk Lab at the University of Cape Town. Uh, Doc, thank you so much for joining us. In a nutshell, what does this report tell us that is new? I think what it tells us is that the science is clear. It brings together the work of hundreds of scientists over more than seven years reviewing thousands of research papers. And the evidence is stronger than ever before that if we start immediately this decade to reduce our use of coal, oil and gas, we will still be able to stop climate change at a relatively low level and live longer, healthier lives on a healthier planet. It also says emphatically that we have the tools and the technologies to do this, and many of them are relatively low cost, such as solar and wind power or preventing deforestation. And then it offers a warning that if we don't change our ways and if we don't adapt to the risks of climate change, then the science is clear that many, many more people will suffer and potentially die, especially in developing country regions where people are highly vulnerable to climate impacts. Uh, UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres on this report says that developed countries should, as a result of this information, bring forward their net zero plans by a decade. You know, South Africa is a bit of a mixed bag developmentally. I mean, we're quite a big emitter, uh, if you, you know, in terms of the context of Africa, but nowhere near some of the, big, uh, the bigger countries. What does this mean for South Africa? What actions should South Africa be embarking on right now? I think that the report doesn't recommend actions for any particular country, but what it is really clear on is that this is a critical decade for climate action, both reducing greenhouse gas emissions by stopping the burning of fossil fuels and adapting to the risks from climate change. And in that context for South Africa, the report is clear that increased international cooperation and finance for climate action from developed to developing countries are key enablers of faster action this decade. And so it also points to contexts of unequal use of energy and inequitable use of resources by saying that individuals with high socioeconomic status contribute disproportionately to emissions and have the highest potential for emissions reductions. So in a context such as ours with high inequality in society, it really talks about the importance of sharing both the burdens and the benefits of climate action. You know, here in South Africa, of course, we don't just uh, have this global worry about climate. We also have a homegrown uh, electricity crisis, as you well know, and that creates its own dilemmas. Uh, I'll give you the example of what's happening at Kusile. I mean, we know that almost 80 percent of our power still comes from coal. Uh, it dipped last year for the first time, but it's still really high. Uh, the Kusile chimney stack that was destroyed recently, the only way to get that up and running um, as quickly as possible is with temporary stacks that don't have the special filters that take out the the harmful emissions. There's an attempt to try and get an exemption from that, which will mean pumping so much um, pollution into the air. But without that, we risk two more levels of load shedding. I mean, it's the worst kind of dilemma to face. Um, what, what do we do in situations like that? How do we as a country balance our urgent emergent, uh, electricity needs and the dire impact is having on the economy uh, with this global concern? I think there are uh, difficult choices to be made, but the, the science is very clear that we need to think of the long term. And in the context of uh, an energy transition, the good news is that many renewable energy technologies such as solar 
are now in many contexts producing some of the cheapest electricity in human history. And so the alternatives are increasingly low cost. One of the good news parts of the IPCC report is that the cost of solar power has fallen faster even than scientific expectations for that. And so there are multiple relatively low cost options as we look to the long term. And it also talks about the importance of transitioning this decade because the fossil fuel infrastructure we have already installed, the emissions, expected emissions from that are enough to put us well past the 1.5 degrees Celsius limit on global warming that the global community is trying to aim for and push us towards two degrees Celsius. So in a, in a context of high fossil fuel use, use, it is really clear about the urgency of transitioning to cleaner energy alternatives and the multiple co-benefits that could have. In South Africa, we know, for example, communities that live close to our coal power stations and other fossil fuel infrastructure often, often suffer higher levels of health complications as a result. And the, the science, again, is clear that in many cases, transitioning away from fossil fuels also improves air quality and reduces air pollution, which lets people live longer, healthier and more productive lives. And, and if we miss those targets, and I think that's the real likelihood, is that there's a real risk that we may miss those, those limits that we're trying to stick to. Not only are we going to see more Cyclone Freddies um, and more destructive floods, as we saw in KwaZulu-Natal uh, and the Eastern Cape last year, but we're also going to lose entire species of birds and mammals and fish. Am I right? Yes, the risks escalate more than linearly with global warming. They, they accelerate quite quickly. And I think I like to think of it it's as if as a global society right now, we're traveling on a dangerous carbon intensive superhighway. And we're currently in the fast lane and we haven't hit the brakes on the carbon emissions yet to pull us off at the 1.5 degrees Celsius exit. And we're already experiencing loss and damage from climate change. And that one point, uh, we're at 1.1 degrees Celsius global warming now. At 1.5 degrees Celsius, that neighborhood we would exit into is more dangerous in terms of the climate than the one we live in right now. But over time, we could adapt to many of those risks and we could even learn to thrive. But just like drivers, if we miss our exit on the highway, it doesn't mean we're committed to going all the way to a terrible, catastrophic place at four degrees Celsius of warming. If we miss the 1.5 exit, we should try and get off at 1.6. If we miss 1.6, we should try and get off at 1.7. Because with every small increment of global warming, the dangers and the loss and damage to humans and nature increases. And as we leave it later and later to get off fossil fuels and we take hotter and hotter exits off this highway, the fewer options we have to thrive and the more dangerous neighborhoods we will find there. Mm. That really paints a very clear and dire picture. And, um, of course, as you say, the next 10 years are going to be absolutely crucial for making all those right decisions. Thank you so much for speaking to us this evening. Much appreciated. Dr. Christopher Tresos, Director of the Climate Risk Lab at UCT.